I'm Marty Nathan. I'm the administrator of the Greensboro Justice Fund. And my husband, Michael, was murdered on November 3rd, 1979. He was a doctor in Durham. As I'm sure all of you know, to my far right is Reverend Nelson Johnson. This is Paul, Dr. Paul Bermanson, who lives in Brooklyn. He was shot on November 3rd, 1979, but survived the attack. Sydney Waller, who I'm sure you also know, who is the widow of Jim Waller and the vice president of the Greensboro Justice Fund. Reverend Z. Holler, who you know better than you know me, who is representing the beloved community center. And Ross Pellis, who is a board member for the Greensboro Justice Fund and is working with our grantees and will have an announcement to make at the end. Um, I thought we might start. Reverend Holler, do you want to make your statement first? Okay. <clears throat> I'll be pleased to. The beloved community center is grateful for this opportunity to help our city come to grips with the tragedy events of November 3rd, 1979. Our purpose in being a part of this commemoration is to encourage in every way available to us a community of justice and mutual respect in which the dignity, the worth, the potential of every person is honored and cherished. The massacre of November 3rd, 1979 was a serious violation of that sense of community. Left as it stands, it can only block the way to genuine community in the future. It must be understood. The truth of what happened must be learned. The truth of why it happened must be learned. And the acknowledgement of it become a part of our community's life if we're to move ahead into a brighter future. So we are very, very grateful for the opportunity to take part in this commemoration. And we seek to help our community find the courage to look at it honestly, look at what happened, to acknowledge it so that we can move ahead to a brighter future together. Um, as I said, I'm Marty Nathan. Thank you very much, Reverend Holler. I'm Marty Nathan, um, administrator of the Greensboro Justice Fund. I will just tell you briefly who the Greensboro Justice Fund is. We came together, the, the core of the fund was um, the victims, the widows and victims of the Greensboro Massacre, um, and friends who desperately needed help in finding justice in this terrible thing that had happened to us. And we became an organization in 1980. But after the last trial in 1985, um, when we were awarded by the federal court money which the city of Greensboro paid, we refounded the Greensboro Justice Fund as, a, as a, a force for support of civil rights and economic justice groups throughout the South. People who are grassroots and have been isolated in their struggle and need help. And we are there for them and have been there for, for them for the last 13 years. Um, my statement, I, you all should get it soon. Exactly 20 years ago, 40 Klansmen and Nazis drove into a crowd of 100 people, men, women, and children, preparing for an anti-Klan march and conference in nearby Morningside community. They attacked with knives, sticks, and fists, then pulled out shotguns, rifles, and pistols, and fired on the fleeing men, women, and children. They killed five people and wounded 10 others. Despite the fact that the attack was recorded by four local TV stations, all of whom I believe are in this room now, none of the killers ever spent a day in prison to pay for his crime. 
They escaped in large part because cover stories were created and spun out to protect them and the police officials who were subsequently found to have colluded with them. The victims were demonized. The killers were just country folks. And the police were striving to toe the line for decent Greensboro citizens. There was no relationship in these cover stories between the victims or their deaths to, to Greensboro and its institutions. That cover story has lasted for years, for 20 years to be exact. Despite the finding by a federal court of joint liability for the death of Michael Nathan by six Klansmen and Nazis, a Klansman police informant, and two police in 1985. This was the first time that we know of in the history of this country that Klansmen and police have been found by any US court of law liable together for an act of violence. Yet the cover stories persisted. City never mit admitted its guilt, despite paying all of the judgment in 1985, including the Klansmen and Nazis share. There's never been recognition of what truly happened, that police were privy to all Klan preparations through their informant and through several other sources. And rather than it protecting the intended victims or the Morningside community, ushered in the killings to the Morningside community. That the young people who were murdered that day, Sandy Smith, Cesar Kause, Jim Waller, Bill Sampson, and Mike Nathan, were respected and successful community and union organizers in Greensboro and nearby Durham. We think that the stories, the covers for terrible deeds, if left in human souls or in a society's soul, will fester with the anger and distrust that they breed. The failure, failure to publicly discuss the truth and rectify wrongs can do nothing but encourage further violence and hatred. We need truth, we need rectification, and we need and would welcome reconciliation. The 1979 Greensboro Massacre was an opening shot for 1980s with its downsizing, concomitant union busting, destruction of the social safety net, and subsequent impoverishment of working and already poor people. Attacking those who fought for such people, in retrospect, was a too clearly defined entree into a decade of painful defeats for people who believe in civil rights and economic justice in this country. We are here, though, because with the beloved Community Center and many other very wise and courageous people in this town, we desire the beginning of closure of this terrible chapter in Greensboro's history. Now is the time for us to begin the conversations that should have taken place um, in the media and by the city 20 years ago. We want to talk with you here in this room about what really happened on the corner of Carver and Everett Streets so long ago, of hopes and dreams of a just society extinguished by Klan and Nazi bullets, but being rebuilt by Kmart workers the pulpit forum, men and women working for decent education and housing, the Committee for Justice for Daryl Howerton, so many people who have so, done so much in recent, recent years. We at the Greensboro Justice Fund represent the victims of the Greensboro Massacre who have gone on to port, support civil rights and justice groups throughout the South. We welcome you to the week's activities and hope that you will share in them as deeply as we will. Thank you. The, uh, the tendencies that were present that day that manifest themselves, manifested themselves on that occasion and uh, brought that all about uh, continue and uh, there is a great deal of distress in the industry that, uh, that the folks were trying to organize. Um, what the future 
poles for textiles, I don't know. But it seems to me a very important thing that uh, we acknowledge that there has been a very great loss uh, with the, what, the winding down of the impoverishment of the labor movement in recent years. And that's what was trying to be, the people were trying to address. Does that get at your question? <clears throat> Ms. Nathan, can I ask you what it is you want from the city? You said you mentioned uh, you want the city to admit its, its guilt in this situation. What, what do you think that would achieve if the city were to say, yeah, we, we uh, conspired with the Klan, we were wrong? I think that there needs to be an open discussion of what really happened. If that includes admitting guilt, then so be it. I think that a number of people have said that 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 should happen, and the court has said that that should happen by finding those two police liable 14 years ago. Um, I think that one statement by the city, though valuable, may not in fact be as valuable as the kinds of discussion and understanding and figuring out what this had to do with Greensboro that are going on right now. Um, I guess I'm trying to say, I don't think that if that never happens, we will not have an accomplished a tremendous amount uh, just by what the beloved community center is already doing with the conversations that went on and what, 18, 20 houses over the last month. Do you all know about these? Um, there have been conversations among people with who never, who didn't know the story, in houses and churches and people just talking, looking at the videotapes and talking about what actually went on at that time, correcting those cover stories. And it's had a remarkable effect, I think. Let me respond to that as well. <coughs> If I could rephrase the gentleman's question, it could be said, um, what does it matter whether the truth is known or not? That's one way to, to say it, and I want to suggest that the conversations are a way to get after the truth. Um, it matters uh, because that's the basis of freedom. Um, you can't have a truly democratic society based on falsehood, based on cover stories, uh, based on the capacity to kill people and the citizens not understand why it happened. Uh, so truth in this case uh, is very necessary in order for us to strengthen the very fabric of democracy itself. Um, and also to free this city from uh, the terrible fears, particularly of its leaders, of uh, even discussing this incident. Uh, when uh, the question was raised by one of the young students at Bennett uh, as to whether the city should apologize, uh, the kind of response uh, was painful to hear from intelligent men. One said that the city should not apologize for the decisions of the court, uh, which is obviously a dodge, as if there were not three trials, as if uh, it was not known that the police uh, gave the permit to the Klan, as if he was not aware uh, that they followed them all the way through town, as if he was unaware that the uh, um, tactical squad was released to go to lunch, as if he was unaware that the person in charge of the tactical squad got promoted to be the chief of police. Uh, he behaved in such a way that it was terribly frightening that so respected a man uh, was not able to simply face the obvious and known truth now, uh, which was to a very large extent, uh, the, through the police department, a counter demonstration was organized. Um, I sat before Lieutenant Gibson um, and applied for the parade permit, looked me, me in the face and said that you have to sign the statement to say that you're not gonna have any arms. I don't know if people even know that. And I raised with him, why are we required to sign something that no one else is required to sign and to take away a constitutional right? He said to me, in my face, 
that it is the job of the police department to ensure protection, and we're going to do that. And it's not your responsibility. Uh, I um, wear the pain of that moment when I struggled personally with people not to bring rifles and shotguns. I did that. I know what I did. And then to see that there were no police there and to learn that they facilitated the Klan coming in uh, and left. If that truth is not known, uh, the citizens have no idea what happened here on Open McCarran, and you don't either. Most of the press doesn't have any idea because there hasn't been a serious discussion about it. There's been a discussion about stuff like their work was stymied in the plants, so they saw a confrontation with the Klan. It didn't happen. Uh, that's a cover story. Uh, that they were on the fringe uh, and they were so hardcore. Uh, Liz Whedon said that no one else would identify with them. Didn't happen. I was elected president of student government at A&T. Sandy was elected uh, president. I was vice president, president at Bennett. Uh, all the people were elected uh, president of unions or leaders of committee. Absolutely absurd. Make no sense whatsoever. Police didn't know where it was going to happen. Uh, ridiculous. I mean, the fact that that would be a discussion when there was only one place ever discussed with them, put on the parade permit by myself on that very day, uh, and uh, how could you miss 100 people at four television station and trucks all gathering? And how could you miss it for so long? Why wouldn't you send somebody to both places? What does it matter to know the truth? The truth is the basis on which we can build a democracy, right? It really is. And um, <clears throat> this is not really about the Klan. It's about the institutions, because the Klan, in the final analysis, did not run the court. They didn't do it. They didn't run Channel 2. They didn't do it. They did not run the newspaper. They did not do it. That all of these participated in either covering this up and promoting loyally the absolute nonsense coming out of the police department as explanations uh, for what happened to this very hour. Mm -hmm. Still doing it, still printing it. And what I'm raising is that um, the very grace and love of God would require us to acknowledge our mistakes. Um, I've tried to acknowledge that I would not use some of the language that I've used before. But we did nothing that was not legal and constitutionally protected. And yet that has been used and uh, almost sold to the public as a justification for what happened. I've been riding down the street and listening to public radio, or not public radio, but radio, uh, in which people said that, uh, I wish Nelson Johnson was killed. You know, I've, been, I've heard that right after 1979. That's the degree of demonization that occurred. Um, I now am an active member, not so active, but a current member of the board um, of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I'm the same person, 1965. Uh, we struggled against poor people, against what was happening to poor people in redevelopment areas. We built the Poor People's Organization. We joined with the blind workers to help them when they were abused. We stood with AAA slum landlord tenants to help fight against that. And that's what was happening in 1979. Um, that story has not been discussed. It's not been told. And it's a tragic omission of the truth and a replacement of it with a series of non-credible cover stories in which the citizens of Greensboro are greater victim than any other group of people in the nation. Everybody else has a better idea of what happened. When you talk about <coughs> acknowledging its mistakes, when you talk about what you live with every day and what you live with since that time, how would it help you in the healing process to have the city acknowledge <coughs> what actually happened? The people of this city, homeless people, poor people, need the unity of a whole community that affirms the dignity and the worth and indeed the potential of all of God's children. And we're not capable of doing it rooted in lies and falsehoods. Truth will set us free. Ms. Nathan or Ms. Wallach, is there a concern 
that the public at large that was not directly impacted by this may not care anymore or has forgotten. Do you guys have that concern? And if you wait for them to bring the microphones over so we could hear. Mm -hmm. Over the last um, several months that I've been here, I've heard people say several things, and among those things are, you know, this happened a long time ago, it's ancient history. Um, it's very painful for people to address these questions again, or, or to, to turn this over and look at it, maybe for the first time to really look at it. But I've also seen I see different responses from different people, and I've seen something I hadn't seen before or knew was happening, um, and that is people are opening up and beginning to question what happened then, what significance did it have. Uh, there is much more openness. I, th I attribute it to the good work that Reverend Johnson and Mrs. Johnson and Melina Cannon and Reverend Holler and others have done in this city. Um, and this, and it is coming to fruition in the fact that there are many more open-minded people, people willing to discuss. I've been to the Presbyterian Church and to, um, uh, I've heard from the UNCG campus, uh, the students over at Bennett College, um, the Guilford College, all over I see evidence that young people who weren't even part of this history, weren't even born, are, are eager to learn, are curious and that their, their parents and older people are willing to take another look and say, um, well, I, I just accepted everything I heard at the time, but, but now I see it very differently. So I, to me, it's a process of democratization. Um, it is, that's why it's important, because it, it's significant for the progress we make toward becoming a democratic society. And if we can do it here, it can be done in other places of, as well. Greensboro could be a leader in this, because we do have this painful incident. And when we can get on top of it and use it to unify us and, and walk together toward a better future, then we set an example. Other cities have similar problems about racism, about uh, workers' rights, and so forth. And if we can do it here, it can be done elsewhere. And I think other people in the world are looking at this city today. Just out of curiosity, has any of, um, anyone ever met and talked with any of the Klansmen there that day? With the Klansmen? And have any, have any of you actually, for whatever reason, talked with them and discussed what happened? And is there anything significant that can be said about that conversation? I think that that's occurred. But I think that that's somewhat secondary to the process that needs to happen. Um, what allowed the massacre to happen on the morning of, of November 3rd was not just Klan's guns. They would not have been there if it had not been the city police whose informant organized them. And so they pulled the triggers. But in many ways, the crime of those who had the power was greater. Uh, the crime that allowed them to pull those triggers, uh, those who allowed them to pull those triggers. And I would hope <coughs> that maybe if the, that the conversation goes back and forth to the city and to those in power, they really are the ones that have to come to terms with this because that will have a lasting effect on Greensboro, much more lasting than should uh, Nelson or, or Paul or any one of us talk to the Klansmen. Um, I had a long discussion in 1987. It has its own history to it. Um, and I've chose not to discuss it publicly, simply because the scenario created, invented, and uh, perpetuated on the people was that this was really an extreme right and extreme left, Klan, communist. I can't tell you how many times I've been invited to be on a show to debate Klansmen. Klansmen didn't do this. And I'm not going to participate in that sort of game. Uh, that they were instruments in a much larger uh, process 
Uh, and as I said, if they squeezed the trigger that day, which people photographed them doing it, they didn't conduct a court. They didn't create all these cover stories. They didn't perpetuate all this stuff. That was the aggregation of the systems that did that. As for, and that is where our discussion needs to be, for you and others uh, to continue to persist to try to make this something between people who are uh, uh, understood uh, to be um, racist and hurting and victims themselves and some other group uh, misses the point. Having said that, let me say that when uh, a demonstration was planned in 1987 for the Klan to come here, I was in seminary in Richmond and I got calls from the SBI, you know, asking me what I was going to do which was again a re, and I'm not even in town, a reinvention of this Klan communist uh, framework called a shootout. Uh, and by the way, no one was hit from, except from one side. No one was injured except from one side. That's a strange shootout, <laughs> particularly if you assume you planned it. Um, and uh, I was troubled by it and didn't know what to do. Uh, I prayed about it, I met with my seminary professor, and I talked with a group of students, and I eventually made the decision to seek out the leadership, uh, and I did. I went to Mount Ullah, and I found uh, the leader in that city, and I went to his home, and I had a letter for him, and I pleaded with him not to come to Greensboro. He was not there. Uh, I subsequently called that evening, and uh, he found out I had been at his home, and I told him to go to the door and get the letter out, uh, and he did. And the letter quoted uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, which called upon them to love you and, and pray for those who despitefully use you. And I said that y'all ought not come here on, uh, in 1987, because you will be spitting on the graves of people who were killed, and you will be stirring up something much deeper than what you did. I'll spare you the details. There was a lot of rancor and cussing and so forth. But I persisted with this gentleman, uh, and eventually, I said that I'm willing to, come to talk to you. And he said that if you will come to me, we'll talk, and you'll have to come alone, and I did. I went to below Salisbury and uh, by myself. Uh, I prayed with my pastor, Reverend Harrison, uh, before I left, and my wife. And uh, I met with them, and we went into a room in a hotel with the windows open uh, and the curtains drawn, in which I sat there and laid out with them uh, by myself, uh, why this was wrong and why they should not come. And again, I'm not going to go into all the details, but that happened. Uh, and I came back uh, with an understanding that I had a commitment not to share publicly, uh, that uh, there was some movement in this. Now, uh, I wrote a letter to the white clergy of this city. Um, and by the way, subsequently, I had a second meeting in which Reverend Otis Harrison, Reverend Carlton Morales, Reverend Jim uh, uh, Green, Reverend uh, uh, Bill Gibson of Richmond, and all of us met here in Greensboro. Carry this out. You don't know anything about it, because I haven't shared it with you. But we've done all we could. And I wrote to the white clergy and pleaded with them to take up this struggle uh, and, to, and to work with people. We are potentially a great city. But that greatness is contingent on facing the truth and being real about it and helping to eradicate uh, the conditions here uh, and to lead this nation out of the quagmire of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poor to the great possibility where a city demonstrates that it cares for all of its citizens and that it no longer plays the game of pitting people against each other inventing cover stories, and playing media tap dance. That's our challenge. Um, that's why we're here. We have no need for revenge. We have no need uh, to get anybody back. We have a need to get it right so that we can be the people that God intended us to be. The Communist Workers Party, people that sent their sons and daughters to Vietnam to fight communism, they've been to Korea to do the same thing. That label that's put on that movement, how, to what extent has that caused the frustration that you feel today? 
Lennon, um, I'm a little excited today. I'm not so frustrated. Well, the labor movement, but the, the labor communism was frustrated. I think that that was um, part of it. I think when the district attorney says that um, something to the effect that uh, I fought against communism in Vietnam, and he's the district attorney getting ready to defend you, and he's publicly making statements like this, it's not just the word communism in some abstract category. It is the deliberate use of that word uh, to confuse and frighten people such that they don't look at the facts anymore. There was never a trial about the facts. There was always a trial about communism. It was a trial of an ideology. And, uh, and I might add, a very distorted presentation of the ideology. And so I think that that label played a very distinct role. Uh, but it didn't just jump up and announce itself. That leader after leader after leader after leader. And when I read the article in the newspaper the other day, I didn't count the number of times that it used communism even before the workers' viewpoint, or even before the Communist Working Party existed. They substituted worker viewpoint for Communist Workers' Party. <laughs> because you needed to get the word in there. Uh, because as long as people are frightened that there's someone so demented and so distorted that they would risk their own children and innocent people, part of the cover story, as long as they think that there's a category of people like that lurking in their midst, it's hard for them to deal with the truth and the wonderful, warm, and loving people uh, who were involved. And the fact that people all over the nation have continued to do such marvelous work, not just here in Greensboro, but everywhere, is simply a testimony to the historic truth quoted by my leader, who says that you will know the tree by the fruit it bears. It's been bearing fruit before 79. It's bearing fruit after 79. There was not an aberration in 79 that people were fighting because they loved people, loved workers, loved poor people, and wanted better for them. That's what it was about. Can I pose that same question to you, too, if you're aware of being involved in that? I, I think the answer to the question would be to go back and look at the newspapers and just do a tally sheet for the number of times that either the names of the individuals who were killed were printed, or what they were doing, versus the words communists, or members of the Communist Worker Workers' Party, or do, you would find that this column would have two or three hits, and this column would be, have about 7,863. The label communist was used to dehumanize us and to make us less than people. We tried to tell you that we were people, that the people who died were not just people, but they were very special ones. That they were caring, loving, fighting, funny, courageous, um, kind of people that you would like to have a cup of coffee with and you would definitely like to listen to because they had some great ideas. You might have disagreed with them, but you would have liked them anyway. But you, but you never, and you, I don't know if you were there back then, I don't remember your face and I don't know your name. No, I was there. Um, yeah. Was he there? Yeah. Huh. Good man. Yeah, using that label, I'm saying, mm -hmm. for, for the label. How many, times did you, how many times did you use my husband's name in whatever you wrote or whatever you put on the TV? That's the answer to your question. It was a, it was a, it was very useful for the cover story. Okay, and the real story was something incredibly complex, and exciting. And uh, the people who, the victims who died that day, were heroes in a lot of people's minds. But they were made into demons and and you know, zombies, people that 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 don't exist. And you were glad to get rid of them if you read those pieces back then. Okay, if you can remember, I would just ask you to go back and read or, or view the, the videos from that time, the, the news, newscasting from that time. There were no humans in that story. Uh, so, um, I, 
I would ask you to analyze your own pieces. Uh, Sending the same question. The movement labeled itself, with, uh, aligned itself with communism. Mm -hmm. Did that make the message get lost? <laughs> well, I did it cause that. people to just discount it? Questions. Because, did it? Did it cause people to just discount it because they said it was just a bunch of communists uh, stirring up trouble instead of the people and the faces and the ideas and the compassion? No doubt it caused people to do that, and I think that was the intention. But I was trained a long time ago as a philosopher, and philosophers are supposed to separate appearance from reality. And the reality was what people were doing with their lives. The, uh, the, the goals that they were actively working for every day, the respect that they earned among their fellow workers, um, their roles inside of families as loving parents, as sisters and brothers and sons and daughters and so forth. Um, so there's a reality about the work they were doing, what Sandy did when she went into the revolution, no, and what Bill did when he went into White Oak and Jim in Haw River and Mike at, at Duke, the Duke uh, Health Thank Center, Lincoln Health you. Center, and Caesar at Duke Hospital. Um, and that work was very unifying for, for people. It was unifying across the races, across many divisions that, that exist in society. And that was the reality. The reality was that when you start to unify people and bring them together and say, we will decide, we will have a democratic agenda, we will all decide together, and it will be for the good of the whole that we decide, and people feel, begin to feel empowered to do that, then we, I feel that this is threatening to the status quo, that it's very threatening to have people come together and say, we are sisters and brothers and we will work together. And, and that's the reality. And then the communism stuff, in a sense, although that is what we called ourselves, you know, but that, in, in relation to that, it becomes an appearance or just a form of that was the form that, uh, that our activity was in. But the reality was the work, the people, their values, and what actually happened. And certainly the word communism, the label communism, was used in such a way as to isolate and dehumanize us. There's no question about that. It was, not only the word was used, it was harped on, banged on, repeated, drummed into people's minds in the press. It was just a barrage. No question about that. But I would turn the thing around. See, I think that the political debate that's considered acceptable is generally pretty narrow. It's the way the system is, is the way it's been, and so it's okay. So we shouldn't really talk about things outside of the narrow parameters that were allowed. I think that what happened in Greensboro was that a group of people who were trying to change the way the system works, change the rules of the game, were shot down in cold blood in broad daylight on TV. And the rest of the population was scared into silence. And I think that the press played a reprehensible role in a great deal of that. There were some very courageous press people who really put out the truth, investigated, found out about Butkovich, found out about the government's role, and did a wonderful thing. But a, a lot of the press, I think, fell into line and allowed that set of uh, set of constrictions and restrictions to exist and allow the, the whole community to be terrorized, in effect, because people are still scared to talk about this. Nelson talks about things that have happened to him over the years. People are still afraid of getting into the truth of what happened. And the caution I would urge is that we read about right-wing death squads all over the world. And the typical story is that right-wing death squads are used to silence opposition to a prevailing order. Now, it happened here. That scares the hell out of me. And I would hope that people would have the good sense to see what actually happened and realize this is a very bad precedent to allow. The truth may set us free, but without it, we certainly can't be free of this kind of threat. The fear that still exists in the Greensboro community, I think, is a legitimate and understandable fear because it's a fear of being shot down for not going by the rules. I mean, that's what I think is the issue with this whole label of the communism. I think, you know, we can discuss particular aspects of a communist program one way or the other. I'm no longer a communist myself for a variety of reasons. But I think that people who dare to think outside and talk outside the box were shot down in broad daylight on four TV stations, and it's like nothing happened. Just to turn that question around, 
And it's just interesting to think about it. To, if we were answer that question in the affirmative, it would sound something like this. Yes, uh, because people labeled themselves communists, they were misunderstood by the Klan, by the police, by the government, and got themselves shot. Uh, yes, because people uh, called the Klan bad names and said that they were cowards, that uh, they actually caused the Klan to come and shoot them. Yes, because the people uh, said the police actually uh, were participating in this, or, or they said they wouldn't participate in the court, that they caused the court not to make a decision to find the Klan of Nazi guilty. Uh, and we could go on and on with that. That actually is what's behind those kinds of questions. They are simply another form of trying to point at the people who are the victim and excuse the behavior of everybody else. And what I want to say is that I'm perfectly willing to accept um, and learn from my experience, um, positive and negative, and uh, I've tried to share that. I invite, urge, and plead with you to help our city do the same thing. Uh, and we can meet that. That's a wonderful place to meet. Uh, and, we can, and we can grow together toward being a wonderful city. Uh, and I think that the uh, media in particular is one of those institutions uh, which has uh, an enormously important role to play. Uh, and we kind of, and it's difficult. I mean, I think all of our roles are difficult. Uh, but uh, as difficult as the one is that God has given to me, I'm trying to play it. And I'm trying to urge everybody else. Our leaders are running from uh, the truth and deal with it. It's difficult. As reporters, stop creating false stuff and report real stuff, what's going on. It's difficult. Courts, you know, uh, and we could go down the line. We would be a much better people uh, and a much better city if we go in that direction. And I want to believe that that's where we're headed. I really don't want us to go away today before we look at the real legacy of the Greensboro Massacre. I think it's a big mistake not to not to move beyond 1979. And we in the Greensboro Justice Fund, through our work, we've really carried on the legacy of the five victims of the, at the Greensboro Massacre, the people that were killed on that day. And so I think that we need to at least have a sense of, of what's happened. The Greensboro Justice Fund is a respected foundation. Since 1985, we've given over $200,000 to organizations all over the South for building organizations carrying on the work of the five that were killed. And I think that's the true legacy, and I think that is what we are looking toward in terms of how do we build not only this community, but communities all over the South. And so this is the kind of thing I think that we have to, we have to look at. This weekend, on the 5th and the 6th, there's a conference of our current grantees, folks who are getting money and our support to do this work all over the South. Folks are going to be at Bennett College on the 5th and 6th, and we invite the press to come to a press conference on the 6th at 1 o'clock to meet some of these folks, to hear about their work, and to get a better understanding of what the Greensboro Justice Fund is really doing now. We think this is critical work, and it's critical to moving forward the same struggles that the people that were killed uh, in Greensboro uh, stood for. So we hope you'll come and meet some of these folks and hear about the work that we're doing. Thank you all for coming.